Hello, everybody, and welcome to our very first GMAT Club GMAT video of 2018. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, especially to everybody in Asia. Right now, it's evening on Valentine's Day. Thank you for spending it with us doing the GMAT. About the most romantic thing I can think of on Valentine's Day. I'm Charles Bibelos, GMAT Club's resident verbal expert, GMAT tutor from GMATNinja.com. What we're going to do today is a little bit different. So that, again, this is our first video of 2018. If you're with us in 2017, we did 10 verbal only videos. This one's going to be a little bit different, a little bit more of a lecture. So today's topic is training you to become your own GMAT tutor. So this is meant for kind of people who are self-studying, taking care of the GMAT on their own. What do you do? How do you think about your study plans? What things do you really need to put into practice to become <clears throat> great at the GMAT? without the help of a course necessarily or without the help of a tutor. So if I do well with this presentation today, I'm going to be out of a job tomorrow. Um, one little caveat here for those of you who are not watching this live, this is live. So if I make any mistakes, when I make mistakes, please don't laugh too hard. Everything's live, no retakes, no editing, no nothing. Um, second little caveat here, this is actually the first presentation we've done with slides. Um, we're not really sure if the technology is going to be fantastic on this, so I, I think you're going to be seeing very little of me and quite a bit of the slide, um, which may or may not be ideal. You may love that because you're going to see less of me. That's probably a good thing. Um, but apologies if this is a little bit uh, choppy today when we're doing this for the first time. Um, one other quick thing. There's a link up if you're watching the live feed right now. There's a link up to a forum page. Go to that forum page, you can download the slides. Um, reason you might want to do that right now, um, especially towards the end of the presentation, we're going to have tons and tons of links in there. We're going to emphasize some of the great GMAT Club resources, other study plans, some of the debriefs, um, some of the resources that you can look at if you need extra quant material or some ideas about how to approach critical reasoning or reading comprehension. So I strongly recommend if you have a moment, go ahead and download that, that file right now. Keep it up on your computer if you want to click on something, go on ahead. So with that, we're going to go ahead with the, uh, the slides for now. Um, and first thing I want to say about this. So uh, the biggest thing I think I run into, so I've been tutoring the GMAT for about 17 years. The biggest thing we run into is just the idea that this is really, really hard. And I think I see people all the time who underestimate this. So Shavik, if you could please get to that, uh, that first slide with the average score improvements, if that's not already up. Um, so GMAT did a study about seven years ago, um, and they said, OK, so when people retake the GMAT, um, how much do their scores improve on average? They found out that on the second testing, most people improved by an average of about 33 points. Um, chances are, if you're watching this video right now, you're not going to be that happy with a 33-point improvement. And actually, if you look a little bit more carefully at that data, what ends up happening is that most of those gains come from people who are starting at a very low level. So if you look at that purple line on the graph, those are people who are starting under a 500. That's where most of the gains come from. So if you're starting in the 600s, you can expect about a 20 point bump if you retake the GMAT. Uh, people who start in the 700s, and that is not unusual at all. I'm sure that some of you watching this today are starting at a 700 or a 720. You're trying to get to something like a 750 or a 760. Yeah, on average, unfortunately, you guys don't improve by a whole lot. If you keep retaking it, on average, you guys go down. Now, if we say that on average people don't improve their scores much, that doesn't mean that you can't improve your score. Um, obviously, how much you put into it is going to dictate how much you get out of it, how much you're able to improve. The smarter you study, the better you study, the more you study, the better you're going to do, just like anything else in life. The reason I bring this up kind of right at the introduction, I want you guys to understand if, you're, if you are new to the GMAT, it can be really, really, really tough to improve. Um, I get people all the time who contact us and say, hey, I've got three weeks. I want to gain 200 points. And the answer is no. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen in three weeks. If you need a big jump, it's going to be difficult. So this presentation is totally dedicated to people who are having a hard time with the test. This is for the hard gainers. This is for people who've worked at this already a little bit, and they've struggled, and maybe they can't afford a private tutor. They can't afford an expensive course. What do you do? How do you keep motivated? How do you keep moving forward? Have the next slide, please, Shovik. Um, so here's what we're going to do today. So this will be the most exciting hour of your Valentine's Day. Hopefully not. Hopefully you did something more fun than this earlier today or later today if you're here in America. Um, three phases to this presentation. First one, I'm going to walk you through kind of a four-phase study plan. And I say plan in quotation marks because um, everyone's going to need something a little bit different. So these are more 
kind of general ways to think about the trajectory of your GMAT studies if you're doing this on your own. Second part of the presentation today, I'm gonna to tell you some key principles. And these are all the same things we tell our students. So you're getting exactly the same stuff that we try to beat into our students' heads when they, when they pay us for tutoring. Um, if we have time at the end, we're gonna to try to keep this under an hour today. If we have some time at the end, happy to take some questions. Um, Shovik is monitoring the, uh, the live feed. So if you have questions, feel free to post them anytime. Uh, he'll collect those. And if we have time at the end, he'll fire those over at me and I'll do my best with them on the fly. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our four phase study plan. Phase number one, um, and I, I suspect virtually everybody watching this right now is already well past this. First thing you always wanna do is just figure out what your goals are, figure out what your baseline is. Best way to do that. So first things first, if you have particular goals for your MBA, certain schools you're interested in, um, yeah, go out there, find out what those average scores are. Really important thing, please, please, please be honest with yourself about your profile. Put some time into figuring out where do you really stand? Um, so we get calls quite a bit for people who say, hey, uh, I saw that somebody got into Harvard with a, with a 580 this year. So my goal is a 580. Well, that person with a 580 was probably very, very special. Um, you might be that person who's fortunate enough to have a shot at getting into HBS with a 580 or a 650. There are very, very few people for whom that's the case. Um, if you are one of those, fantastic. Uh, everybody else watching right now is jealous. For most people, that's not realistic. Um, and so just be honest about what your profile is. Plenty of wonderful experts on GMAT Club. Go into the business school forums on GMAT Club. Start asking questions. Start reading other people's experiences. Get a sense of when you look at those ranges for business schools and their GMAT scores, get a sense of where you fall. So if you're somebody who is, for example, um, in the dreaded Indian male who works in IT demographic, you probably already know that you're going to have to be way at the high end of those scales to have a shot at those top schools. If you're somebody who has some diversity cards to play, or you were an Olympian, or you've achieved something really, really unusual, sure, maybe you can get away with a score that's at the lower end of the ranges for your target schools. Please be honest with yourself first so that you know what you're trying to achieve on this test. Uh, second thing we want you to do, if you're just getting started, take one of those GMAT prep exams, just one. There's only six of them, you're gonna need those. Uh, so take just one, um, get yourself familiar with the question types a little bit first. You don't wanna be totally blindsided, have no idea what data sufficiency means when you get in there. So make sure you've had a taste of all five GMAT question types. Go take an official GMAT prep exam, first two are free, go to mba.com, get yourself a free GMAT prep if you haven't already, get a score. And that way you can say, hey, I think I need a 740, I just got a 640, I've got 100 points to go. Or, hey, for the schools I'm interested in, I need a 650, I just got a 600, life is great, I only need 50 points. So be prepared. If that gap between where you are and where you wanna be is really, really large, get yourself prepared right at the beginning for a long haul. Some people improve really, really quickly. For some people, 100 points isn't so hard to do. For most people, that takes some time. Be prepared for that right away. And again, this is the same thing we tell our students. First conversation we have before we even meet with them to, to do any real studying, hey, let's talk about your goals. Let's make sure that you understand that gap between where you are and where you wanna be. Then you have a sense of how long that might take. So first thing, be honest with yourself about where you are and where you're trying to get to. Phase two. Um, so one of the things, one of the biggest mistakes we tend to see is that people will jump right into all the official materials, jump right into those GMAT preps. First three weeks of prep, they go through all the GMAT prep exams. There's still 200 points from their target score. Now they've used the best tests out there. Now what? Please don't do that to yourself. <laughs> so what I want you to do, really, really focus first on the things that are going to take you the longest to improve. Now, this is going to be different for everybody. So I can't say, hey, I need you to study exactly this list of things. Everybody's going to be different. So if when you take that initial GMAT prep exam or, or whatever it is you've done up to this point, if you're saying, wow, my verbal's a really long way away, the thing that's going to take you the longest on verbal to improve is going to be critical reasoning and reading comprehension. Um, we've got links up here to a couple of the beginner's guides. If you haven't seen those already, that might be a good place to start if you haven't really worked on those question types before. Um, one thing we recommend for some people, you might want to try to stretch your materials using the LSAT. Here's the thing, for some people, critical reasoning and reading comprehension can take months and months to improve. I actually had a student once who did 4,500 critical reasoning and reading comprehension questions. Her score went up about 120 points. Her quant was fine to start with. Virtually all of those gains came on verbal. Critical reasoning and reading comprehension were her weaknesses. She spent four months, four to six months 
did thousands, literally thousands of these questions. That's overkill. She got into Harvard. Her life is wonderful. She's a special case. I don't recommend doing that many, but it's something that you should be prepared to at least think about. The things that you're the worst at in the beginning that take the longest amount of time is where you should start focusing your energy right at the start. So if you need a lot of practice on critical reasoning, reading comprehension, LSATs might be a good way to go. It stretches your materials. I'll talk more in a little bit about the limitations of the official guide. There's not that many questions in there. So LSATs are one way to stretch it. There's a link that talks about that. Um, if you're finding that just the issue on verbal is that your reading just isn't very good, you're having a hard time understanding passages, great. Think about spending some time, just spend six months, spend a year just getting better at English. That's the case for a lot of people. If you're seeing your verbal score down in the teens, low 20s maybe, what you might need isn't anything to do with the GMAT or LSAT or anything to do with test prep. It might just be more time spent reading high quality material in English, improve your English first, then come back to the GMAT. Painful thing to say, nobody wants to hear that. Unfortunately for some people, that's reality. If you hit that uh, reading comprehension beginner's guide, there's some links in there, some wonderful posts that uh, GMAT club members have made about good reading materials, good novels, good periodicals that'll help you get better at English. Now notice here, I'm not mentioning sentence correction in phase two. The reason is that we have a very finite number of good sentence correction questions. And kind of the domain of things test on sentence correction is pretty finite. Now there's no harm if you wanna start boning up on grammar a little bit, read some of those guides out there. We've got some good stuff on GMAT Club. Work on some of your grammar foundations. Fantastic. It's definitely not going to hurt you. But it tends to be something that doesn't take a ton of time. The thing that's going to take you the most months, if it's a weakness for you, is the critical reason or reading comp. That's one of the things you want to jump in on right away if it's a problem. Quant. A uh, wonderful fellow, if you're not familiar with him, guy named Bunuel, uh, GMAT Club's resident math expert. He's incredible. He's written some posts that are just amazing. This is one of them. This is his All You Need for Quant post, links to a book that uh, he and some other GMAT Club members wrote. Um, what I want you to think about in this first phase of quant, if quant is a weakness for you, algebra and arithmetic, I know not sexy at all. Nobody wants to hear that. Um, but for somebody who's 10, 15, 20 points from, away from their goal on quant, first thing I want you to really focus on is make sure that you're really, really smooth, fluent with your algebra and arithmetic because that underpins everything. Don't go crazy on the things that don't show up very much. So probability, combinations, rates, overlapping sets, all of those things are important. Don't go crazy on them right away because there's not that many of them on the test. Focus on the things that underpin everything, algebra, arithmetic, maybe your word problems, percents, ratios. Those are the most basic foundations, maybe geometry a little bit. Kind of in this early phase, those are the things you want to focus on if you're a long ways from your score. And I've gotten bold up there. Execution. What do I mean by that? Most important thing I can possibly say to anybody, don't make careless errors. If you get into that habit in the beginning, really hard to come back. If you monitor, you can follow the share GMAT experience section of the GMAT Club forum. Um, and people love to kind of focus on the, the stories of glory. Hey, I, I, I improved my score by 200 points. And those stories are wonderful. I'll give you some links to some of my favorite ones in a, in a few minutes. Um, the thing we actually see much more often, for every one of those great stories, we see 10 people or 20 people or 30 people who say, hey, I studied really hard. I'm good at math. My score was terrible. What happened? Well, the reason almost always is careless errors. So it's missing things that you know how to do. I'll talk about this more in a few minutes. What I want you to really focus on is right from the start on quant, make sure you're being really careful. Read the question twice. Make sure you don't misread it. Check your work as you go. Don't make careless errors. Can't emphasize it enough. It is the biggest reason why anybody sees a disappointing score. And what I mean by disappointing is less than they expected, less than their practice test scores, less than they think they deserve on quant. Right from the start, be precise. Don't make careless errors. Um, and finally here, we're just in phase two out of four. Official guide is limited. Um, I'll go through some numbers of the number of questions that are in there. You might want to save the very best materials for later if you've got a long ways to go. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Phase three is when you start introducing more of the official stuff. So now we're starting to get close to your test. You've built your foundations. Your arithmetic's great. Your algebra's great. Your word problems are great. You've studied your geometry. You've done that long, hard work if you needed it to get better at reading, reading comprehension, critical reasoning. Yeah, now's the time to start going. If you were using LSATs, if you felt like you needed to do that, now's the time to start doing more official guide questions from the GMAT. Um, rule of thumb, and we'll talk more about this in some of the future videos in this series, 
If you're going for something like a 40 on verbal, you want to be at about 80% on those LSAT sections and getting them done in under an hour. And again, we'll talk more about that in another video. Um, sentence correction. Now's the time when you might as well indulge, go crazy on those. There's only a few hundred uh, official sentence correction questions in the official guide and the verbal guide. It's not that much. You can run through them in a few days if you're really, really hungry and really driven. Um, you don't want that to happen. So be really careful. Don't binge on the sentence correction early. Um, make sure you're saving some of that stuff for closer to your test. That's why I advise you to, to save most of the sentence correction for phase three. Quant, now what you can start doing in phase three, start introducing those less common question types. You wanna work on rates, you wanna work on probability, you wanna work on combinations and permutations. Now's the time to do it. You don't wanna to peak too soon on it because there's just not a ton of them on the test. I think your, your time is gonna be used the most effectively if you focus on that stuff closer to your exam. Phase three is the time to do it. And finally here, big thing you wanna start focusing on as you kind of start getting into the official guide, start getting closer to your exam, now you can start doing practice tests. Um, in general, I don't recommend non-official questions for verbal. Um, it's so hard for test prep companies to write questions that really mimic the style of the test. The GMAT spends between $1,500 and $3,000 developing each question. Um, apologies to everybody who's heard me say that dozens of times already. Um, so it's really, really tough in particular for verbal for them to get that right. Um, so whenever possible, use official materials for verbal. Now for quant, um, my personal feeling is that even if a question's not official or even if a test is not official, still can do you some good. It might not be exactly the same, that the test scores might not be exactly accurate, but you can practice your timing. You're still learning something about math. It's still good for you in some way. Um, so feel free to do some of those non-official tests, GMAT club tests. We've got dozens and dozens of quant tests. Um, really, really difficult for the most part. Great practice. Here's where you're starting to work on your timing. And we'll talk more about what that means in just a second. Um, next slide, please, Shavik. So when are you ready for phase four? What does it mean to graduate from phase three? Phase four is when you're getting the practice test. There's when you're going to do your GMAT prep tests. So when are you ready for those practice tests? When are you ready for that final polishing? When are you ready to start thinking about your test date? First and foremost, all the homework you're doing. No careless errors. Miss all the hard stuff you want. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, what it means to do an adaptive test. Why making those careless errors is so deadly to you. First thing, make sure that you're not making careless er errors anymore, any question type. On quant, you're trying to make sure you're not getting stubborn. So make sure that you're not having any questions on your quant tests that are over three minutes. And just in general, you need to be comfortable with your results. One thing we see all over the place, unfortunately, on the GMAT Club forums, people will say, yeah, I, I went and I took my test, even though I, I really didn't feel, I really hadn't done much sentence correction. I didn't feel good about it. Or, or I was struggling with X, Y, and Z in the official guide, I was struggling with my quant, I was struggling with critical reasoning, but I thought maybe I'd go in and take the test and it would be okay. Be honest with yourself. If you don't think your results are very strong, hang on keep working at it. It's hard to give you a rule of thumb and say, oh, in the official guide, you should be at 80% if you want this score, because the difficulty levels vary so much depending on exactly where you are in the GMAT official guides. But if you're not sure, if you're kind of saying, well, I've done some non-official practice tests for quant, they looked good, not really clear about how I'm doing on verbal, this might be a good moment. Right at the beginning of that GMAT official guide, there's a diagnostic exam it's not perfect, but it'll give you a sense of where you stand. So if you're not sure how you're doing and you've already spent a lot of time, you've already done a lot of official questions, you like how you're performing, your execution's good, no more careless errors, that might be the time where you use the diagnostic and then you can jump into phase four. So what does phase four look like? So this is when you're getting into the GMAT prep exams. Um, so there's six of them. So maybe you used one as a diagnostic right in the beginning. Fantastic, you can always retake it. Um, by the time you get done, if you've done months of prep, you're not gonna remember that first test all that well. It's still gonna do you some good to redo it. Um, unfortunately, only two tests are free. The other four you have to buy. Um, there's a link to the exam packs. Uh, $50 for two tests. So if you buy uh, all four of those tests, it's gonna cost you about $100. Right now they're running a special. Get all four tests for $90. Um, depending on where you are in the world, big investment. Um, I think it's one that's very, very much worth it. When you think about what you're going to spend on the exam, on your business school degree, it's the one thing. If you're going to spend money on one product besides the official guides, that's probably the one. Second thing, there's a link in there. We call these the fake tests. So there's the GMAT prep question pack. We have a way of using those questions to kind of create the illusion of an actual test. It's not adaptive. It's not going to give you a score the same way that the actual GMAT club cats will. But 
it'll give you that same feeling. It's going to feel like an exam if you do it right. Give you that practice under time pressure. Really, really good way to use them instead of just kind of using them as loose questions. Click on that link if you're curious. It'll kind of walk you through exactly how to set that up. So obviously, that's going to be the backbone of that final, let's say, month or depending on how long you're taking, maybe two months or three weeks, whatever you need. Um, obviously, between those tests, work on your weaknesses, whatever comes up in those practice tests. And one last thing, again, we see so many people who write us these anguished messages, um, you know, both personally to me as a tutor, people I meet on GMAT club, things we see posted publicly on the forums. Uh, I just took my exam. I'm so disappointed. Well, what, your, what were your practice test scores? Well, about the same. Well, wait a minute. Then you can't be disappointed. So be honest with yourself. So if you're, you want a 740 and your practice tests are at 680, you're not going to get 60 points out of luck. It's not how the test works. Maybe 30 points plus or minus, probably not a lot more than that. Please be honest with yourself. If you need more time, take more time. It's one of the most important things we can possibly say. And now part two. So that's kind of the big picture. That's what your study plans look like. Notice that we're not telling you exactly what to do because everybody's different. Biggest thing, be honest with your weaknesses. Go from those kind of most official materials should come towards the end. Your best up, save that for the end. GMAT preps phase four, official guide, mostly phase three. Start by figuring out your weaknesses. Work on those foundations. If you need more quant skills, yeah, get into some of Boonwell's materials. Get into those quant skills. If you need more work on verbal, do some reading. That's what you should do in the beginning. As you move forward, get to the better materials. So save those GMAT preps for the very, very end. Um, all right. Part two, this is going to be seven general principles for how best to approach your studies if you're doing this on your own. And like I said, this is exactly the same stuff we tell our students or exactly the same things that, that we do in terms of how we guide our students through the process. Um, first things first, um, official questions are absolutely king. I've already said it a couple times, um, especially for verbal. Nothing can replace an official question. Um, I think you can get some good mileage out of quant questions that are not official verbal, you've got to be really careful. And I want you to be really careful from day one. It's really, really tough once you've done every official material out there, every official verbal question, every official guide question, from every edition of the official guide, from the verbal guide, GMAT prep question pack, you're still 150 points from your goal. Now it's really, really tough to keep improving. So think about this from the very beginning. So that official guide looks like a nice fat book. Those quant guide, verbal guide, not as fat, but you add all that up, it looks like a lot of questions. It's actually not really that many questions. You add up the quant guide, verbal guide, official guide, you only have about 700 questions for quant, about 700 for verbal, just a little bit more. Now, if you're doing about 30 questions an hour, so two minutes per question, and let's say you're studying for about three hours a day, you can run through those in a couple weeks for quant, a couple weeks for verbal, then what? So be really, really careful. If you're not fairly close, reasonably close to where you need to be, don't start binging through those official guide questions. One more quick thing you can do if you need more questions. Let's say you've already done the official guide. Let's say you've done the 2018 edition of the official guide. Let's say you've done everything in there. One thing you can do, go see if you can get a used copy of the, the 12th edition from back in 2008 or 2009. Every time they release a new edition of the official guide, they swap out about 15 to 20% of the questions. So if you get an edition that's five or six editions back, um, then all of a sudden you've got 60% of the questions that, that will be new to you, whether you're starting with an old edition first, doing a newer one later, or vice versa, you'll get about 60% more questions from doing that extra official guide. Same idea is going to hold for the quant guide and the verbal guide. They've released fewer editions of those, but if you go back and you do, let's say, the first edition of the verbal guide and the current 2018 edition, you'll get about 50% more questions um, in whichever guide you do second. So that's one thing to think about if you can get your hands on a used copy of an older edition. Not a bad way to kind of pump this up a little bit. But again, even then, we're still looking at a total of only about 2,000 questions from, from all of these resources, which again, sounds like a lot. But for those of you who are having a tough time and really need to study hard and study for a long time, you're going to burn through those 2,000 questions in a big old hurry. So think about all of this stuff beforehand. Make sure that you're not just kind of willy-nilly going through official guides. You might be disappointed as you get too close to your exam. Same idea obviously holds for the GMAT prep. There's only six tests. Sure, you can redo them, but then your scores are going to be inflated. And then you're not really going to be sure where you stand walking into your exam. So be careful with those. 
GMAT prep question pack. There's an extra couple hundred questions in there. Fantastic. Like I said, we recommend using those kind of as these fake tests if you can. Um, so there's a decent amount of material here. If you're only going to study for two months or three months, you're fine. You can do almost exclusively official materials and be okay. But again, for those of you who might be looking at a time frame more like four months, five months, six months, a year or two, which is not unusual, unfortunately, be really, really careful with this stuff. Okay, principle number two. Um, and I, I referred to this earlier. This might be the, not might be, this is the biggest reason we see disappointed people who are underperforming their actual skills, especially on quant, but it's true on verbal as well. Here's the biggest thing. Hold your own feet to the fire about careless errors. So what I really want you to do is be honest with yourself. So when you do a set, let's say you sit down, you do 37 quant questions from the official guide. What a lot of people try to do is they say, they, they look back at the errors and they say, hmm, well, I missed seven of these, but I understand why I missed five of them. Those, those were really silly mistakes. I'm going to focus on those other two. Cool. Focus on those other two. There's some math you need to learn. That's great. It's those five I'm really worried about. Why? Nature of an adaptive test. I think most of you who are watching this right now, certainly the live audience, I think most of you already know quite a bit about the adaptive test. Plenty of resources on GMAT Club if you want to go looking around and get into more of the nitty gritty of exactly how it works. Basically, what an adaptive test is doing, think of every question on the GMAT as having a difficulty level assigned to it. Um, the test is trying to find the level of question at which you get roughly half right, half wrong. And because they know you can guess, it ends up being about 40%. Is, is that level of question that they're looking for. The level of question at which you get roughly 40% right. There are exceptions if you're way up at the top of the scale or way down at the bottom, that won't be the case. But especially on quant for most people, if you're anywhere between, you know, let's say a 47 on your quant down to about a 27 on quant, which is gonna encompass a pretty good chunk of, of GMAT test takers, you're gonna miss in the neighborhood of 40%, give or take, on your quant section. Regardless of whether you get a 27 or a 47, obviously those are radically different scores. It doesn't really matter how many you miss. It matters which ones. You miss some easy questions at the beginning, you're going to see more easy questions. And it's going to be really, really, really hard to convince that algorithm that you deserve anything difficult. If you never see hard questions, your score will not be good. That's just how the algorithm works. So that means that in practice, um, missing easy questions is absolutely deadly. And I can't emphasize this enough. If you make two or three careless errors in those first handful of questions, you're in trouble. Really anywhere in the test, if you start making careless errors, you're in trouble. So what do we need you to do? And we're going to talk about this a whole lot more next week. So next Wednesday's video is going to be about how cutting corners um, can kill your GMAT score on both quant and verbal. So what I want you to do, first and foremost, as you're, as you're doing quant in particular, but verbal as well, I want you to be systematic. Like right from the start, I want you to think about, hey, how do I build in systems, rhythms, techniques, habits that are going to ensure that every single time I'm doing the quant question the same way. Every single time I do critical reasoning, I've got an approach. I'm doing it the same way. Every time I do sentence correction, I have a plan. I have an approach. I'm doing it exactly the same way. Um, my focus is the same all the time. Quant in particular, the thing that we beat into our students mercilessly. I want you to read every question twice. Check your work every step. Check every step as you go because you drop a negative a couple times on that test, there goes your margin for error. You can miss two easy questions just by saying, hey, that's easy. And the answer was negative six instead of positive six. And everybody makes those mistakes. The key is, do you take the time to catch them? And again, this is going to be part of what we're going to talk about in next week's video. Um, so really be disciplined about that right from the start. 100% um, true. Um, the people that we get to know well, either on the forum or our private students, who are really disciplined about that, always end up being happy. The ones who are not disciplined on that always end up seeing a ton of variation in their scores. Maybe they have a good day on test day and maybe they don't. So be disciplined about that right from the start. And you might be saying, hey, I don't have time to read the question twice. You can't afford not to. And we'll talk a whole lot more about how actually doing that will save you time. And that's going to be a lot of next week's uh, lecture. Um, verbal, this is a little bit of a trickier thing to sort of say briefly what it means to sort of be systematic on it. Um, those beginner's guides to reading comprehension, critical reasoning, sentence correction, we talk about that a little bit. Again, we'll visit this more next week. But the, the heart of it is what a lot of people do who aren't systematic is they're going to read that reading comprehension passage differently at different moments, differently on different days, differently depending on how they're feeling the time pressure. Can't have that happen. 
So if you're going to read super, super intensely for details, that might not be a great idea. But however it is you're going to read, you need to do it the same way every time. Don't skim one day, read intensely the next. Take notes one day, not take notes the next. We'll talk more about that stuff next week again, but make sure that there's an approach to every question type for you that's going to be the same every single time. That's what's going to help insulate you against missing things that you have no business missing. Second thing, um, manage your time really, really carefully. And this is a huge, huge topic. Um, and there's tons of discussion about this on GMAT Club. On quant, don't get stubborn. Don't spend five minutes, six minutes, eight minutes on a question. It's really remarkably easy to do. Like you'll look at something. It might be question number three and you go, yeah, 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 I, I should know how to do this. Geometry, I studied geometry. I should know how to do this. And you get stubborn and seven minutes go by can't let that happen. If you don't see a path forward, get out. Don't let yourself spend more than three minutes on any question. It's not worth it. Remember, unless you're way off at the top of the scale, um, you're going to be missing about 40% of the questions. Even if you get something like a 49 or a 50, you very well might be missing 20, 25%, even as you get way up on the scale like that. 51, you're, you still can miss questions and get a 51 on quant. So make sure you're not getting stubborn because if you go spend eight minutes on one question and four minutes on another, you're going to feel like you're behind. You're going to start scrambling. You're going to start rushing. You're going to make those careless errors. Then your game is over. Verbal, same idea. One of the worst things I, I ever hear from people is, well, I don't know why my score was so much worse than my practice test. Tell me about your test experience. Well, I fell behind on verbal, but then I caught up. As soon as I hear that phrase and then I caught up, I know exactly what happened. At that moment when they started trying to catch up, started reading sloppily, that, that technique fell apart. It wasn't systematic anymore. All of a sudden, careless errors, and then you're in trouble. There aren't any great gimmicks you can do. There's no magic, you know, magic algorithm you can do to speed up on verbal. Um, if you have to guess at the end, guess a little bit at the end. If you try to rush through questions on verbal, guaranteed you're going to misread something, miss some easy questions, and that's where scores plummet for people who deserve much, much better. So this is probably the single most important slide. Again, we're going to get into some of these issues more deeply next week. Most important thing by far, don't let yourself make those careless errors. Okay, principle number three. Um, what we always encourage people to do, so th there's an instinct to jump to the back of the official guide and, and read explanations of things. Careful, don't do that just yet for a few reasons. First and foremost, those official guide explanations are, I shouldn't say they are crappy, I should say they're sometimes crappy. They are not written by the same people who wrote the questions um, in, in general. So those questions often um, were, were written 20 years before the official guides were printed. So they aren't always the, the best way to do a question, first of all. Second, more importantly, those explanations can't tell you where you went wrong. So the thing we really care about, especially on verbal, but it's true on quant as well, if you made a careless error, if you have a tendency to, let's say, forget about negatives when you're doing your algebra, we need you to figure that out. And the back of the book's not going to tell you that. So what I want you to do instead of jumping to the back of the book or jumping to GMAT Club and reading those explanations right away, I want you to wash your brains. Take a day or two. Forget about the set as best you can. Wash your brains. See if you can forget about it. Come back to the question again. Go redo everything that you missed two days earlier and see what happens. What I'm really, really interested here isn't so much the ones that you missed twice. Those are things that you might need to study. Those might be the things where it is worth your time to go look at the explanations. You know, Maybe there's some principle you're missing, and you need to go back and learn some foundations of ratios or percents or sentence correction or, or whatever. Those are worth working on, don't get me wrong. Things I'm really interested in are the ones you get right the second time. Why? Those are technique errors. Those are things that you should have had right the first time. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, why is it that I missed those? What was the thing that caused me to goof up? What do I need to be more careful about next time? When did my focus lapse? When did my technique fall apart? When was I not systematic? Those are the most important ones. Because again, goal number one, you've got to insulate yourself against those careless errors. So much more important than anything else I can tell you. OK, so principle here is redo those errors first. Then if you miss them a second time, then you can go to the explanations. Principle number four, um, and you, I'm sure that any of you have participated in the forums, you see this all the time on the forums, track everything. Keep track of everything you do meticulously. Here's a link to some error logs, um, plenty of different templates out there. Uh, most test prep companies offer some up. Plenty of people on GMAT Club have offered them up. Here's a thread that's going to give you a few different options. One thing you might want to think about in particular, keep track of those careless errors. See if you're seeing improvement in them over time. Also, I really want you to include the times you spend on each set. 
Um, so if you see improvement in, let's say, critical reasoning or reading comprehension, that's one of the areas where a lot of people get really, really, really nervous about the time and go, I'm so slow at critical reasoning, so slow at reading comprehension. And let's say that you're one of those poor souls that might need to study those things for months, maybe a year even. Yeah, you're, it's going to be really, really valued, valuable to you in your sixth month, month of prep when you say, hey, when I did my first set of reading comprehension, I did 25 questions and it took me 75 minutes. Now look at this. It's taken me 45. That's so valuable to see that progress, especially if you start to get discouraged. Everybody has bad days. Um, if you have everything tracked in a really neat, clean way, it's, it's a fantastic way for you to be able to say, hey, there's improvement here. Or wait a minute, I used to know how to do exponents. And now all of a sudden, two months later, I did worse on this set. That data is so priceless. Keep track of the dates you did everything, the time you spent on everything. Um, principle number five, um, no binging. I mean that in two different ways. Um, and I think they're probably equally important. In, in the first way I mean with no binging is I don't want you to binge too much in terms of how much you study. What we recommend to our students, so assuming that people are working you know, 40 hours a week or 45 hours a week in a nice normal job, which of course is not the case for everybody, um, something like two hours per weekday is about right, maybe three or four hours per weekend day, something like that. It's going to get you to about 15, 18 hours a week. Why that much? Well, first of all, if you're doing less than that, you probably won't get the exposure to all of the glorious variety of the GMAT. Um, as much as you'd like. So if you do much less than that, your progress is going to be fairly slow. Here's the problem. If you do more than that, what's going to happen in hour number five, hour number six, hour number 18 on Saturday when you try to just study like crazy, you're going to start making those careless errors. Don't let that happen to you. Um, so don't binge in that sense. Also, don't binge on certain question types. So one of the things I see people do sometimes, they'll do quant one month and then verbal the next. By the end of that month of verbal, they've forgotten their quant. And I think it's really, really unhealthy to do, let's say, critical reasoning, reading comprehension are your biggest weaknesses. And let's say that in your second month, you decide you're just going to go all out on verbal. Uh, so you're going to spend 15, 18 hours a week doing verbal. And you know that you're worse at critical reasoning, reading comp. So 12 of those hours are critical reasoning, reading comp. You're going to drive yourself nuts. That is excruciating. It's going to be really hard to improve. You're going to burn out. So don't binge on topics. Focus on your biggest areas of weakness, absolutely but don't do it completely at the expense of other things. So it's very, very rare that we meet anybody who should be doing just quant or just verbal, unless you're perfect at one or the other, which is very, very rare. Chances are you need some balance in terms of the question type. So be really, really thoughtful about how to keep some balance in terms of the types of questions you're doing. Don't do too much on a single day. And just as importantly, don't let your life become unbalanced. This is another thing we see all the time in some of those more anguished share your GMAT experience posts on GMAT Club. I quit my job. I, I, I broke up with my girlfriend. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Uh, I, I haven't spoken to my family. I haven't exercised. Uh, I'm sleeping four hours a night because I'm studying 20 hours a day. Yeah, that doesn't end well. It never ends well. Make sure you keep balanced. What's important to cognitive function? Sleep, exercise, having a social life, being basically a happy person. Make sure those things are still in your life. So if you do more than about 15, 18 hours a week, or much more than that, depending on your appetite for studying, all those other things start to become unbalanced. Mountains and mountains of research will back me up on this. Sleep in particular, but everything, diet, exercise, being balanced in other ways, having a social life. Those are all things that will improve your cognitive function. At the end of the day, this is a test where we need you sharp for four hours, sharp, sharp, sharp. If you get burnt out because you're not sleeping and you're studying too much, it's not going to work out. So keep balanced 15 hours a week, 18 hours a week. Don't go too crazy and do too much more than that because then you risk just getting burnt out and your performance is going to decline. So make sure you're keeping your life balanced. If that means it takes you a few more months of prep, great. It's going to be worth it in the end, I promise. All right, principle number six. Um, so one of the, maybe the greatest thing about GMAT Club, so obviously, you know, we've got mountains and mountains of resources. Um, virtually anything that any tutor or test prep company can tell you is available in some form for free on GMAT Club. And once again, I think I've just talked myself out of having a job. Um, 
but I think the even better thing than all those resources and all that content and all those practice tests, I think is, is just the community and the ability to see people who've, who've been down the same road you have, especially if you're struggling on this test. If you're one of those hard gainers, and again, this, this entire presentation is dedicated to you guys who are looking for 100 points plus, and this is going to be hard for you. Take a look at some of these debriefs. Spend some time in that shared GMAT experience section. You're going to see some people that are unhappy, and that's it's not fun to see people who are suffering, but you know you're not alone. People form study groups. People meet study buddies. Um, all sorts of wonderful connections happen. The four debriefs I featured in here, these are four of my very, very favorites. Why? Um, these are for people who achieve just incredible, incredible things. Um, so we have somebody who started a 420, got to a 700, got an HBS. <clears throat> it took him years. <clears throat> and his debrief is fantastic. And this is an older one. This is from quite a few years ago. Um, there's a fellow who went from 350 to 700. He worked really, really hard for it. It was not easy. <clears throat> somebody else, verbal score jumped by almost 20 points. And uh, some fellow named Shovik um, took him four years to get a 760. Um, so these are people who I think really exemplify um, what really happens to people who achieve these gigantic score improvements. So sure, you'll run to the occasional person who managed to gain 200, 300 points really, really quickly. They exist. They're exceedingly rare. These are the real stories. And there's tons of them on GMAT Club. Stay inspired. Stay honest about what this really is. Again, the GMAT the GMAT data says that the average person who retakes the test <clears throat> only improves by about 30 points. Yeah, and that, that makes perfect sense. It's not to say that you can't improve by 200, 300 points. Some of these folks did. Um, but look at their stories. They had to work so hard, so diligently, so thoughtfully. In some cases, they, they got quite a bit of help from the community. These are the real stories. Take a look at these, especially when you get down, you get tired. Take a look at some of these guys. And there's plenty more where these came from. Um, and again, be honest about your progress. Um, one of the biggest things we, we see is that people will take a practice test or two and, and say, well, I got, a, I got a 680 on this practice test and all my others were in the 500s, but you know, I should have a good day on test day and I'll, I'll get a 700. Careful. There's a lot of reasons why those practice tests can be a little bit deceptive. One is if you're seeing tons of variability in general, well, where are you going to land? That's a sign that the consistency is not there. Sometimes non-official practice tests can be inaccurate. They can be great practice. They can be worth doing, absolutely. But sometimes they're not totally accurate, especially if you're really familiar with that company's methods. So if I go, if I were to write some GMAT Ninja tests, which we have not done and probably will not do, um, and I've got you doing all of the GMAT Ninja net methods for everything, chances are pretty good you're going to do better on my tests than somebody of comparable skill who is not familiar with the way we teach. So there's all sorts of reasons why those practice test scores might be a little bit inflated. Don't cherry pick them. If you've redone those GMAT prep tests, your scores might be inflated. So there's a link there that talks about that. What happens when you go into your actual exam and you think it's a lot lower than your practice test scores? There's a whole bunch of reasons why that might happen. Please be honest with yourself throughout the process. Don't cherry pick and go, well, my best test was a 680. All my others were in the 500s. Odds are pretty good. Those 500s are the real thing, and that 680 was an outlier of some sort. Or more importantly, there's probably something about the way you're approaching things that's causing that variability. So be honest with yourself. This is hard. It's supposed to be hard. It's designed to be hard. Um, one thing, one quick thing I'll say about the way the people who design standardized testing think. They love to say, yeah, we've designed a te test that is uncoachable meaning that you can't get test prep coaching and expect improvement. The GMAT's very, very proud of the fact, they don't say this publicly, um, when I've met GMAT, um, GMAT psychometricians, they've actually said, yeah, you know, we do all these things to ensure that coaching won't really work. It's not to say that improving your skills won't work. Improving your skills will definitely work. There's not going to be tricks and little tips and little gimmicks that are going to get you very far. It's going to be tough. The test is designed to be as unpreppable as possible. Be prepared for that. Again, some of you guys are going to study for a few weeks and knock the cover off this thing, and that's fantastic. Um, for some of you who are really, really struggling, you can do it. Again, check out those uh, those debriefs from those four, uh, four folks who achieved just unbelievable things. Took them a long time. That's the normal experience. Um, OK, so principle number seven. Um, and this is our, our final thing for today. Um, I'm just going to walk you through a little bit of, of the other things we have on GMAT Club. I really want you, principle number seven really is I want you to maximize your use of the forum. Um, so in general, here's some resources. Um, so one of our, um, I think it's an admin or a moderator now, um, fantastic fellow named uh, 
Abhimana is his handle on the forum, wrote this great, great, great post about how to best maximize resources on GMAT Club and kind of runs through all the things that helped him, some of the, the tools that are on the site. Um, one of the things he really emphasizes is you can follow you can follow threads, you can follow entire sections of the forum, and you can follow particular individuals. So for example, if you really need some help on quant, Buñuel, who's an absolute genius on the forum, constantly answers everything immediately. Uh, you might want to follow him. Uh, Verbal, there are four or five of us who are um, pretty active on the Verbal forums. Hit that follow button underneath our profiles. And then there's a follow feed that you can click on and you'll see all of our posts whenever you want. Um, I think participation really, really helps. Um, and one thing you'll see out of a lot of those folks who achieved those gigantic improvements over time when it was really tough for them, a lot of them did really participate in the forums. The cliche that teachers love to, to spit out is, is this idea that one, one person teaches, two people learn. Um, and I think it's very, very true. And, and I can speak from a little bit of experience on this. I've only been super active on GMAT Club for a little bit less than a year. Um, I've been teaching test prep for about 17 years. Um, every time I try to write an explanation of something, I, I learn something about this test. Um, there are additions to the official guide I could probably recite to you. And then when somebody asks me a question, I have to phrase it well. I realize some little thing or my, my depth of understanding of that grammar rule or that, that logical principle becomes deeper. It'll be the same thing for you. Invest some of your time if you have it. Put some time into writing explanations. Answer questions. Post what you think the best solution is to a question. It's going to help crystallize how you think about the test. And again, especially if you're really struggling, writing up some of those explanations, participating, having dialogues with other members really, really, really can help you solidify how to think about the test. We've got a great question of the day series. So every weekday, um, there's both a quant and a verbal question of the day. Um, so there's an RSS feed there, so you can subscribe there. Um, and there's also a link to all of the previous questions of the day. Um, so subscribe to that. You'll get two questions in your inbox every weekday. Um, so second part here um, on the GMAT Club resources. Um, so plenty of study plans that we have out there. I think that's the next one. Advance that slide if you could please, Shevik. Um, so a few of our, our power members, and there's tons of different plans available. Tons and tons of people have done them. Here's four of my favorites. So um, some guy named BB, he's actually the GMAT Club founder, um, still super active. Like he'll, he'll answer your questions. Phenomenal, phenomenal guy. He's written two different plans. He updates these every year or two. So there's a regular plan there in one link. There's an advanced plan. So if you're at 650, you're trying to get over the 700 hump, for example, that advanced plan might be for you. And uh, a lot of the he talks about a lot of the same principles I do. But if you want a, a different take on this, some different opinions, some different links, take a look at those. Um, there's a daily study plan that some fellow named Shovik wrote up. There's a link to that. And once again, I know I keep talking about poor Boonwell today. Again, he's a badass. Um, this is his link to all you need for quant. Um, and it's not exactly a study plan, but it really is this kind of comprehensive set of resources, uh, many of which he's written himself or other GMAT Club members have written. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. So if you need more plans, want more ideas of kind of how to structure your thinking, how to structure your studies, take a look at some of these links. All right, last thing. Um, one other thing, we're, we're just really getting into this on GMAT Club. Videos, so we did a series of 10 verbal videos uh, last year. Um, admittedly, they're a little bit rough around the edges. Again, everything we're doing is live. Um, so we're kind of still banging out some of those uh, those glitches in it. Take a look at those verbal videos if you need help. Most of them are sentence correction. A couple of them get into critical reasoning. Not a comprehensive series, but if you like to get your, your GMAT content in YouTube form, take a look at that link. All of the links to the other videos are there. Um, current video series, this today is video number one of eight. And the theme here is we want to help you develop a better, stronger GMAT mindset. So these eight videos are going to be a mix of quant and verbal and general study tips. Um, and these are going to be every Wednesday, same time, so 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. Next week, we're going to talk about how cutting corners on the GMAT can kill your GMAT score. Um, and very, very important, please, please, please um, hit that subscribe button on the, uh, the GMAT Club YouTube page. Um, we're going to be doing quite a bit more video content admissions consulting stuff as well. Um, hit that subscribe button. That way you know when stuff's coming up. And obviously all of those verbal videos from last year are also up on the page. Um, and I think I have, yeah. So we're running out of time. I don't think we're going to take questions today. So 
Um, if you have any questions, um, I think Shovik is probably collecting some of them right now. Feel free to click on that link. So in this, on this same slide right now, um, that link to the current video series. Um, go ahead and click on that. Um, if Shovik hasn't already collected your questions, go ahead and hit that link. Feel free to ask your questions in that thread. And I'm happy to answer them there. Um, and we'll try to address some of them in the next few presentations if they're relevant to some of our topics. So hit that link for the current video series. All the topics are up there. If you have specific questions you'd like to add, feel free to put them in there. And that is it for us for today. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And once again, please hit that subscribe button before you log out of YouTube today. Thank you again and happy Valentine's Day.